Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I can tell you feel like a million bucks over there. I'm telling you, yeah, I got that tingle today, that podcast tingle. Well, you've had your eight day break from work and you've basically slept the entire break, so you must feel rejuvenated. Well, I must say, I'm pretty sure I have a sleeping disorder. Number one, shift disorder. Number two, um, I have fat apnea, I think. And number three, we was lazy together over this eight-day break because we binged entire seasons of shows and shit. Well, that's true, but I'm only lazy because you influence me. That's true. I've made... (laughs) Us being together has made you a lazier person. Totally. When we met, I was not (laughs) lazy at all. I never sat around watching TV. I was always on the go. Baby, I'm sorry. I I would go to the gym every day, exercise religiously... I like to cuddle with you, though. But being with you, I've turned into such a fucking slob. Oh, my God. It's your fault. I've got to change my ways. You really do. We'll shoot for next. I try to influence you to do things, and you just are very uh, lazy about it. There's no other word. The fact that we're having, like, Seattle in the winter weather here the entire winter is not helping any. The monsoon season. Yeah, and that with COVID, because you can't do shit. And on top of, we live somewhere where there's hardly anything to do anyway. So you take you factor in COVID, then there's even less to do. <sighs> All you can do is rewatch the first season of Game of Thrones, right? Which, by the way, I'm excited that we're rewatching and we've been binging Game of Thrones again. Such a good fucking show. Oh, my God. And I was very late to the game. You know, a lot of people started with the first episode when it came out. What was that, 2011? I did. I told you. I was saying, you were asking me questions. I was like, dude, it's been like 12 years since I've seen this. And you were like, what? And I was like, yeah, I was I was that guy. You who, were one of those people. Yeah, that couldn't wait for it to start back. I always had HBO, typically. And uh, yeah, I watched it as it came out. And it was very frustrating, because then they'd have... Instead of six or seven months between seasons, you know, they had like a year, a year and a half between seasons. Oh, my goodness. I watched it right before I met you. Like, we met in 2018, started dating, and I had binged it from like February to April, like the entire, like what, seven seasons. And then we got together and were able to watch the final season to get, you know, like together. But I'd like, it was still fresh in my mind. So it's still kind of... Like, I remember a lot from the show because I just watched it a few years ago. But it's fun to go back and rewatch it because there's so much that you forget or these little hints, foreshadowing. Oh, there is a lot of that. And I must say that I'm not, in some instances, I think binging a a season of something is bad because you don't get time to think about the storyline or wonder what's going to happen. But Game of Thrones is very bingeable. It is. Oh, man. I have some true crime news for us. We should start with this. It's very interesting. There have been a few murders out of Virginia that I've been interested in over the past few years. Uh, One of those is the 2009 murder of Virginia Tech student Morgan Harrington. And I actually remember driving through Virginia right after she had gone missing and stopping somewhere around like, you know, Blacksburg or something. And there were these missing posters for her. Really? And, and like quickly, you know, searching the case and wondering what was going on with her. And then later there was the UVA student, Hannah Graham, that was murdered in 2014. And the guy charged with it, he's been arrested, gone to, you know, gone to trial, everything. His name was Jesse Matthew Jr. So those were two fascinating cases. But there are others along the Route 29 corridor in Virginia. There has been speculation there could be a serial killer or multiple serial killers praying on you know kind of in that area so are we talking like four or five cases maybe yeah there's a couple well there's a a young woman she was a 17 year old virginia teenager her name was alexis murphy and she set out for a shopping trip in august of 2013 was going to drive 45 minutes from her hometown shipman down to lynchburg oh i've been there yeah it was about a 45 minute drive just going to go pick up a couple of things, and she's been missing since. They were able to arrest a man, charge him with murder. They did find some DNA, some evidence to tie him. His name was Randy Allen Taylor, and he was actually captured on surveillance video holding a door open for her at a gas station. Really? And then he was charged with murdering her. They found DNA, like I said, on his shirt. They found a fingernail, and they were able to link him to her, but they've not been able to find her body. You know, there's a, there's not really a good excuse 
for someone having left their fingernail behind with you, right? I mean, people usually take their fingernails with them. Well, her family, of course, has been freaking out over the last seven years, eight years, trying to find her body. And this guy, Taylor, Randy Allen Taylor or whatever, he wouldn't tell them where he had buried her. So they finally were able to locate the remains this past week. Um, and they actually found her body on uh, some private property near Stage Bridge Road, which is along Route 29 in Lovingston. And it's near where she had stopped for gas. Well, there you go. But they were able to find her. Family is finally able to put her remains, you know, to rest. But what a crazy story. I mean, I'm really happy that they were able to find the body at least to give the family a little bit of closure. I'm sure that is very meaningful to be able to have the body and, and, you know, do something with the remains. Well, yeah, and it sounds like the investigators in that area are... um working diligently and uh, trying to make connections and uh, you know they're at least thinking about what if there's a possibility of the you know these things are connected and it's really scary to think this guy was at a gas station he held a door open for her I mean that happens all the time you go to a gas station someone opens the door for you I've had multiple men do that and just to think that in the quick period of time that you can go purchase your gas or whatever leave that some crazy person can follow you, kill you, and you're buried, like, right by the gas station. Well, I mean, that's just, I mean, in our everyday life, we have we may have come in close contact with a, a monstrous person like this and just don't even know it, you know? It's so scary. Oh, man, Lynchburg is such a cool town. Can I say right quick? Yeah, we really had fun there. It's a cool little town, and if you if you live there, you know it's cool. And uh, if you uh, ever thought about somewhere, going visiting somewhere that's a little different, than your usual tourist trappy spots. It's full of rich in history, has a great little um, kind of uh, developed scene, redeveloped scene down by the river. Oh, yeah, like a downtown area. Yeah, it's, it's very really historic. Cool. Yes. But yet also kind of cool and modern. And it's just a beautiful surrounding area. Yeah, it's gorgeous. We had a really good time there. Yep. Yay, Lynchburg. <laughs> we'll have to go back sometime, Dylan. <laughs> yeah, but I have something to say. Oh, uh, yeah. Will you give a shout out to our new patrons? Yes, because. I'm so excited. You know what? I'm feeling this. You are feeling this. Uh, yes, we have uh, quite a few here, actually. I would like to thank uh, this, today's episode is sponsored by Michael. Thank you, Michael. Myra. Thank you, Myra. Tessa. Thanks, Tessa. Nicholas. Thank you, sir, Phyllis, and Brittany, and Amanda. Phyllis has been a long-time listener. Yeah, I know. She's been very active on our social media as well. Phyllis so, ain't playing around. Thanks, Phyllis. Thank you to all of you and all our other patrons, and you're what keeps this show going. Yeah, so, if you want to join patreon.com slash Mountain Murders Podcast, we have a lot of bonus material there, tons of extra content, give you something to listen to. Uh, yeah, and sometimes we're just plumb stupid over there on Patreon. Well, somebody is. Oh, man, there's even a couple episodes of me being, um, they claim I'm intoxicated, but I don't believe it. Are you ready for today's case, Dylan? Uh, yes, let's do it. This is something a little different Ooh. than uh, any case we've covered before. Really? So I'm excited. Are you, I'm very excited today. Let's just keep using that word. Somebody get me a thesaurus. I'm excited. Are you ready? Let's <laughs> do this. Let's go. The full college experience is something that many young people long for. And it's an often viewed as, you know, something very important, like a stepping stone to adulthood. So what is the college experience? When you think of that, Dylan, what comes to mind? Well, um, I think p if people listen, they know I didn't have the college experience. But I think in my mind it would be you're leaving home for the first time. Right. And maybe uh, you get a kind of play grown up like you're making these decisions. Mom and dad aren't, you know, over your shoulder making all these decisions. And I, I'd say it's kind of exciting, you know, because you're, you're not sure what it's going to be like. And you feel like it's a transition from being a kid to an adult. 
I think that's a perfect way to describe it. Wow. I think most people would agree it's a journey of self-discovery. For the first time, like you mentioned, Dylan, young people are living independently, away from their parents. They're transitioning into becoming a self-sufficient adult. Some consider part of the experience participating in campus activities like Greek life or clubs, while others think it's drinking and partying all night. I was going to say, you get a chance to do the walk of shame, right? While getting an education, students are often making lifelong friends. Fall semester 1984 at Teal College in Greenville, Pennsylvania, two freshmen from vastly different backgrounds meet and become fast friends. Teal is a small liberal arts school affiliated with the um, Evangelical Lutheran Church. It is considered one of the smallest colleges in the region. Typically, they only have about 900 students. Wow, that's pretty small. It's located in a picturesque small town. There's a wooded setting, and it's located halfway between Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Roger Butch Pratt, and we'll be calling him Butch throughout the story, and Ed Swiger met freshman year when they lived on the same floor, like in the same dormitory. I'm sorry, did you say Ed's? Uh, Butch and Ed Swiger. Ed. Ed Swiger. Okay. Okay. Butch was from Blue Collar Munhall, Pennsylvania, in the Pittsburgh area. His parents were divorced, and he lived with his mother, Rose. She was a nurse, and he had a brother and a sister. As a child, Butch was diagnosed with bone disease in his right leg, forcing the boy to wear leg braces for several years. He walked with a limp when he was young, but by high school, Butch was determined not to let the ailment keep him from playing sports. His senior year, he was named Best Male Athlete at Steel Valley High School. The happy-go-lucky, goofy, and outgoing redhead with a big grin and bright blue eyes was a football player, wrestler, and star catcher on the baseball team. Wow. Sounds like not only did he play sports, sounds like he excelled at sports. Definitely. Butch was easygoing and quite the ladies' man. He just oozed charm. A redhead with blue eyes. Everyone thought he was so adorable. I'd say that would stand out. His family would describe him as a lovable prankster. If there was a family photo, Butch would be the one in the background throwing up the bunny ears on his sister or making some kind of silly face. So he's the photo bomber. The photo bomber, yeah. Ed Swiger had a very different personality. He was ambitious, quiet, and sometimes described as cocky or arrogant. Like Butch, Ed had been a lineman on the football team, and he enjoyed weightlifting and studied kickboxing. Swiger grew up in Tiltonsville, Ohio, with four siblings. His father, Ed Sr., owned a furniture store and was a county commissioner. The Swigers were an affluent family in town, but Mr. Swiger was a tough dad who insisted that his kids toe the line. Ed Jr. worked in the family furniture store. Mr. Swiger wanted his kids to learn the value of the solid work ethic, despite the fact that the family was upper middle class and they were pretty well to do. But he still wanted to instill, like, a work ethic and the value of money in his kids. Well, yeah, I think that's just good character building, you know, components of your child. And though Ed enjoyed this luxurious lifestyle, if you want to call it that, um, his father wanted all the kids to see that you had to work hard and that nothing was handed to you. So even though he was driving a nice car, that kind of thing, it didn't come without a price tag. Butch and Ed became fast friends, best friends. They were inseparable. You'd rarely see one without the other. Ed was hyper-focused on his education. He had big dreams of law school and possible political aspirations for the future. He was obsessed with studying. Ed's habits would rub off on Butch, and Butch began taking classes more seriously. Like, the further along they went in their friendship, Butch, who was just kind of like happy-go-lucky, having a good time, he really started looking up to Ed. Because Ed was so focused, always studying, straight-A student. So did uh, did you know, were you that type of student in college? Or did you know people that were not only in college being young and having fun and, you know, doing classes, but actually talked about this is just a, a moment in our life, but it prepares us for the rest of our life? I definitely had friends who were more ambitious and disciplined. I was not that student. <laughs> Oh, my God, you were doing the walk of shame. I was like a poison song, nothing but a good time. Oh, I bet you was, baby. Well, I've always been this kind of student. If I really like a class or I enjoy the subject matter, I'm an A student and will do wonderfully in school. 
anything like when I was in college, all of my core classes for my major, anything having to do with the journalism, film studies, I was an A student. But when you would shove me in like a general ed, like a biology class or statistics or like a computer science class, eh, not so much. You're going to pass it, but you're not going to be the shiny coin up front. No. Yeah. No, I just can't. My brain doesn't want to, I guess I just can't get my brain to like engage in stuff that I find boring. See, I wish I'd went to college and just life circumstances didn't work out for me like that. I actually ended up dropping out of school in 10th grade and started working, which I mean, I guess I got a different kind of education, if you will. But um, yeah, but all that came naturally to me. Now, math, mathematics, once it got up to the algebra and such. My brain's just not wired like that. Like, I, even when I tried to help my kids um, later on in life with the, those types of subject matters, it just doesn't compute for me. Yeah, I'm not a math student by but, any stretch. <laughs> but besides everything else, I mean, I, I could just pull A's, all A's, B's, and just killing it, you know? So I wish I'd went further and found out how far I could have went. Well, any class that required like just essays or, you know, writing papers, I was guaranteed an A because I'm a pretty decent writer. See, but I was, it, you know, it just, plus I found out as an adult that I have ADD. Me too. Which I feel like I had that as a child too. Like I had a really hard time focusing on things. And if it had been caught earlier, maybe I would have been a better student. But my mind, if I'm not interested, it's really hard for me. It's very exhausting to try to focus on something. Like, my mind is rushing a million places. So if I'm not interested, I'm all over the plate, you know. See, what I would do... I have a hard time concentrating. Is I would rip through the work, finish up early, you know, for doing in-class work. And then I would be done, and I'd get a good grade on that. But then I would goof off. I would start talking to people or bugging people or, you know, sitting there flicking your pencil. So I was... You were that kid? Well, I think I was too smart for the world. Like, they didn't relate to me. I was basically like a modern-day Albert Einstein. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I mean, that sounds like what I'm describing. Well, Ed had those wonderful study habits, and Butch began taking notice and started focusing more on his schoolwork. At Teal, Butch had no trouble getting dates. Ed, however, was not as popular with the ladies. He rarely dated. Butch used his charm and good looks to find dates for his friend, and they would often double date together. Oh, so Butch is like, uh, you bring your friend, I'll bring my friend, and we'll have a double date. Yeah. Okay. After freshman year, the pair rushed Delta Sigma Phi fraternity. So they were Delta Sigs. Ed, concerned with resume building, also became active in student government as well as in the fraternity. Eventually, he'd be voted in as Intrafraternal Council or the IFC president, and he spent less time participating in the fraternity's social activities and more time in the library. So even though they were part of this fraternity, Ed was still very focused on grades. Like, he didn't let being part of the fraternity keep him from his goals. Yeah, it's like he's going to even... Being part of the fraternity, he's working on the inner workings and the financial parts of the fraternity and how it actually works instead of just getting drunk as hell every day at the frat house. Right, exactly. Ed and Butch worked out together frequently. They were often seen exercising, hitting the gym. They both enjoyed shooting guns and hunting, fishing together. Eventually, Butch got involved with student government as well. So as you can see, Ed is a pretty good influence on Butch. Sounds like it. Impressed with his buddy's hard work, Butch decided that he wanted to attend graduate school and planned on getting an MBA. So is that a master's? What does the MBA actually stand for? Yeah, it's like a business. Well, I know it's a master's in business administration or something like that. All right. I'm not sure. We'd have to look it up. Someone out there is yelling at me right now. Somebody's like, I got an MBA and you're stupid. Yeah, I don't know. That's all right. I got a... PhD in the School of Hard Knocks. Oh gosh! Yeah, you is that, like that? Is that on your like Facebook bio? That's on my resume at work, and that's what my re- I turned that into employers. You don't even have a resume. And you know what they say? <laughs> They're like, you know, finally someone who is not only intelligent but someone who's grounded. Under his qualifications, he has a skill of smoking cigarettes and talking shit. Well, I can do those things because I can do he's those got things. a PhD in the School of Hard Knocks. I can also rail against the system. Okay. So, I mean, who doesn't want that person on their um their team at work? A lot of people. <laughs> I've, I've heard you on one of your tirades. 
During their junior year, Ed was handling fraternity affairs when he stumbled across the organization's financial problems. The fraternity owed money to the national headquarters and seemingly had no prospects of paying down this debt. It was around this time that Ed managed to get his hands on a pass key, which could be used to access the Delta Sigma Phi house as well as neighboring fraternity houses. This is when Ed hatched a plan. Ed presented his friend Butch with an idea which could help the fraternity as well as make them a little extra jingle. So it sounds like the uh, the fraternity's been mismanaged, if you will, up to this point, and no one's crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Taking Likely. care of passing the money up, managing what money's coming in and what money's going out. You know, maybe they weren't collecting the proper dues from the brothers, passing that on. You know, and a lot of the Greek organizations will host fundraisers, that kind of thing. Or if they're having some sort of um, special party or something, they might charge a cover right, type of thing and then take that money and put it towards, like, the bills and whatever. So, yeah, it seems like just poor money management has happened in this fraternity. And the thing is, if you don't pay your national headquarters, um, they could come in and close down your chapter. So they basically say you're not Delta Phi anymore. They this revoke, chapter's Yeah, they can closed. revoke your charter and shut you down on campus. And wow. that takes some time to be able to get that fraternity or that Greek organization back on campus after that happens. So it'd be a big deal if they were to come in and shut them down. Yeah, I knew a couple of different Greek organizations when I was a student that were shut down. Um, some of it was due to lack of members or like not enough paying the not enough members paying dues kind of thing. And another one was like a disciplinary. Oh, just they, like they had, well, they had several disciplinary infractions, including like there was a student who had been hazed with alcohol and had died. And oh, it was no. a huge deal. And this was actually like before I was even a student there, but I had a good friend who was part of that fraternity at the time when that, happened and he explained to me how like you know they got into all this trouble and then the greek organization came in and like revoked you know revoked their charter so then they didn't have a you know they didn't have a fraternity there anymore and it took them some years because that happened in like the mid 90s and then it was not until the early 2000s that that fraternity came back to campus that some guys were able to get it to come back so wow it's a big deal. yeah so ed has approached butch with this idea to help out help out their brothers in yeah. their house. Yeah. And as you can see, Butch is the kind of guy who looks up to his friend Ed. He thinks Ed is the man. Ed seems like he's got his shit together. He's charming. He's intelligent. He's a hard worker. And Butch just admires all these things about Ed. Ed's very polished. Comes from a little bit of money. He's just not the regular kind of goofball college kid. So even though Butch is the kind of ladies' man, athlete guy, he looks up to Ed in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and I think you'll see throughout this story that Butch is a bit more of a follower, whereas Ed is like the leader. And that's okay. Right. Unless you get led into their own shit. Well, during spring break of 1987, when everyone is off campus, Ed and Butch would break into the houses using the passkey, and they were going to steal electronics. And this was the 1980s, so most everyone had stereos, boom boxes, televisions, and VCRs. I mean, these were like sought-after items. Yeah, I don't think people, now, these kids nowadays, appreciate what, that this is like the height of electronics. I know we got all these tablets and computers and things nowadays, but, I mean, these things were very, rather expensive. Well, like a big stereo system, yeah. the big ass speakers. I mean, people would spend thousands of dollars on one of those big yes. stereo systems. Yes, and if it was a a VCR, oh, dude. I mean, now you can get one for what, like twenty bucks? Well, DVD you, players like twenty dollars. Yeah, but VCRs even up to when DVD started taking over and pushing VHS out, you could still go drop. Two or three hundred bucks on a VCR. Yeah, I feel like do when all kinds we of stuff. first got a VCR in the eighties, that it was like four or five hundred bucks. Like it was expensive. Yeah, and it was a big deal. Oh yeah, you know, and to have like multiple TVs in the house was like a big deal back then. So yeah, the electronics mattered. 
Yeah, totally. And the boom boxes, I mean, you had to have that big stereo system. It's funny to me how everything went from being huge down to like being tiny. But now we're getting back to that whole idea of the big boom box. Like I saw one recently in one of the big box stores. It was like one of the big 80s boom boxes, but it was all like Bluetooth, uh -uh. digital. Yeah. Dude. And I was like, well, it's funny. Like, what the fuck? I want that. We we just went through a period of downsizing, and now we're going to go back to these big, bulky stereo systems again. I want that. It's funny how everything comes and goes in trends. Okay, so they're breaking in. They're going to break in. Well, Ed explained that the fraternity's insurance would pay off the missing items. So in the end, their friends would end up with newer, nicer things. Because at first, Butch is like, no way. I'm not doing this. I have no interest in, like, breaking in these houses. But Ed's like, look, nobody, it's a victimless crime. No one's going to get hurt. The fraternity has insurance, so anything that's missing, the, the brothers can file insurance claims and probably end up with nicer things. And we're going to make a little money off of this. And we can pay off the debt of the fraternity. Yeah, so it's really for the greater good. Okay. They could take the items, fence them, and... Make somewhere between three to five thousand dollars. As Ed rationalized the plan, he explained it was really just a win win for everybody. And like I said, initially Butch was skeptical. He didn't want to get caught up in trouble, but Ed was so manipulative. Butch was a people pleaser who really admired his friend, and he didn't want to let Ed down, so he reluctantly agreed to help with these burglaries. Well, and it's like Ed is kind of straight-laced in Butch's eyes, too. You know, he concentrates on his his studies and his career, you know, thinking about his career later in life. So maybe he's thinking, well, maybe this, you know, he's buying his bullshit, if you will. Right. Well, after stealing a bunch of electronics, the pair stashed them in the attic of the fraternity house. When the brothers return from spring break, they're up in arms that someone has broken into the Delta Sig house. The burglary is reported to police. Butch wasn't expecting an investigation, so he gets very nervous. Well, I mean, of course they're going to come. you got multiple houses that have been broken into and cleaned out. Well, uh, they're going to come by and at least ask questions, dude. I mean, damn. Well, that's where I don't feel like he really thought out his involvement. Yeah, he didn't maybe think about how big a deal this really is. Ed tells him not to worry. I've got it under control. Law enforcement determined there was no forced entry, and they soon figure out that somebody had to have a pass key. Well, uh, I, as soon as you said that, I thought that's easily traced. Had to be some kind of inside job. And this is when Ed's name is brought up. He is interviewed by police, but denies any involvement in the burglaries. And with no real evidence to tie Ed or Butch to the crime, the case just hits a dead end. So the cops, he ends up on the list of people to talk to. They talk to everybody they can think of, but it goes nowhere. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take a quick break, Dylan, and we'll be right back. And we are back. After the burglary, with Heat on the duo, they know they can't sell the stolen merchandise in Greenville. Ed reaches out to his younger brother, Michael, who attends Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Michael gets the goods, and he sells the stolen electronics to his fraternity brothers, and they make about $3,500. Which is a chunk of change in 1980. 1987. 87. That's still... Yeah, no, it totally is. Before senior year, Ed and Butch decide to move into an apartment together and out of the fraternity house. Both are involved in student government and want to spend more time studying because they both have plans to apply to these secondary education programs. Again, you know, graduate school, business school, and law school. The two were like big men on campus at this point. It's a small school. Everyone knows them. They're in a popular fraternity. They're student government guys. So they're just like the cool dudes on campus. It is at this time that Ed has been working out at a gym called Pro Body Shop. And it's owned by a local surgeon who has a number of businesses in the area. I think the surgeon owned like 15 different businesses in town. Oh, yeah. It was there that the 5 foot 10, 260 pound stacked bodybuilder Ed catches the idea, um, the idea, I'm sorry, the eye of a woman named Linda Carlin. You say it's 5'11", 260? 5'10", 260. Good night. She described his legs as being like just fucking monster muscle legs. Yeah, like, I mean, unless uh, he's uh, like me and just fat, 
That's a big guy. No, he's like a very big muscular dude. And he kickboxes really into working out and bodybuilding. Lynn manages this gym as well as some other businesses for the surgeon, including a furniture store, Old Town Furniture. Lynn was in her late 30s. She made a pretty good living, about $75,000 a year, which in 1987, it's a lot of money. Well, that's good money now. She owned two Cadillacs, a Corvette, wore expensive designer clothing and jewelry. Being an older woman, she was sophisticated. Ed and Lynn began a flirtation, which soon morphed into a full-blown romantic affair. But there was only one problem. Ed had a college girlfriend. Oh, no, Ed. And she knew about the burglary. Oh, Ed, you dirty dog. Ed felt like he'd outgrown his peers at this point. Lynn sh- showered him with these fancy, expensive gifts, watches. She even decorated a room in her home with fancy office furniture and books, telling Ed that this was for his first practice as an attorney. Oh, wow. She's really swooning the young Ed. She even gave him $4,000 for a down payment on a Ford Bronco, co-signing on the loan for him. Man, why would you pay that much down on a car? You shouldn't even do that. I don't know. Ed was smitten with the older woman. He dumped his girlfriend. When she learned that she'd been tossed aside so that Ed could be with this woman who was nearly 15 years older than he was, his ex-girlfriend was really fucking mad, as you can expect. And she knows sensitive information about Mr. Ed. His ex shows up at the Delta Sig... Sig house, and she spills the beans on the spring break robbery. I mean, hell hath no fury, dude. So she goes and tells the brothers, his brothers, and but she didn't go to the cops. Right. Not too smart to cheat on her, right? Well, the Delta Sig brothers are imaginably offended. They're disappointed and just plain mad. Two guys they considered brothers have stolen from them. The fraternity immediately blackballs the two brothers, and to everyone's surprise, this doesn't seem to phase the pair. Ed and Butch moved off campus before, like I mentioned, and they were focusing more on their studies, the future, their student government positions. Ed is preoccupied by his relationship with this older, experienced lady that he has in Lynn, and he feels like he's moved beyond this college crowd. So his fraternity brothers turning their backs on him, it just doesn't even mean anything to him. He doesn't care. Well, it sounds like them having moved uh, out of the house. If they were living there in the house, it'd been a lot bigger deal, I think, because you got to live around these people. And uh, But, yeah, they'd already kind of disconnected from their this crowd. And they probably hung out less, probably saw them less. So, yeah, I could see that happening. But, you know, even I'm sure their brothers were, like, very pissed off about that. They were really mad. Because it doesn't matter even if you recover all your money or even get more money back from insurance. That's a pain in the ass. Anyone who's ever made a claim to insurance, and that hasn't really changed over the decades, it's it's not easy. It takes time. And this whole time, you don't have all your stuff that's been stolen. You feel violated that someone came in and went through your stuff. And then to find out later that it's your buds? What a betrayal. Your brothers? Yeah, I mean, you've like sworn an oath that these are like your brothers, right? And you are all good friends. You trust each other. You live in the same house with one another. I mean, you have to trust these guys. And then to find out two of them have come in, stolen from you. Yeah. I mean, it's like trust out the window. It's pretty messed up. And the brothers were like, what the fuck? Because once they blackballed the guys and wouldn't speak to them... Ed, nor Butch, ever apologized, brought it up, said, I didn't do this, denied it. Or or this is why we did it. We thought it would work out, but sorry, or nothing. They just never, never had contact with them. And just cutting off contact was like an admission of guilt to these guys. So they were like, we know they did it. Lynn is having some financial troubles at the furniture store. The store where she has made Ed the new assistant manager. Now, remember, Ed's father owned a furniture store in Ohio. So he's grown up working in this furniture store, understands the ins and outs of running that business. So that's not actually nepotism at play. He actually would be a good fit for that position. Exactly, because he knows about this business. So she hires him, puts him in place as the assistant manager. While Ed is brainstorming ideas on how they can, you know, figure out this financial crisis... Lynn tells him that she has a plan. If Ed will set the store ablaze, she'll be able to collect insurance money to cover the debts. That's 
probably not a good plan. Now, it has been mentioned, but I can't confirm that the financial discrepancies are from an employee who embezzled $100,000 or more from the store. Oh, you reckon it could have been her? Well, I wonder. Oh. Either way, Lynn wants insurance money. Let's say people come up with these plans about arson, and they're like, well, it's going to be empty. It's just a building. We'll, we'll hit the insurance up for it. But a lot of times I don't think they take... You have uh, emergency crews that are going to risk their life to keep this from spreading through the neighborhood or whatever, Put get the fire put out. So every single time these crews come out, firemen especially, their life's in danger. So you're endangering all these people with your little shitty little plan. Absolutely. It is one week after graduation, May 22nd of 1988, at 2 a.m., that the warehouse behind the store goes up in flames. Police are suspicious, and, and an arson like investigation begins. When detectives hear the names Ed Swiger and Butch Pratt, they are immediately reminded of those unsolved campus burglaries a year back. So those names kind of stick out for them, huh? On the radar, police began asking questions, eventually bringing Butch to the station for interrogation. It is during this interview that the fraternity house is brought up again. But Butch, I mean, he doesn't, uh, he just can't handle the pressure. He doesn't want to continue living a lie. So he folds and he tells them what happens. About the burglary? About the burglary. Oh, so he's just had enough of that. It's bothered him. It's been on his conscience and he just gives it up. Yeah. They, they apply the pressure, keep asking, hey, this happened and you and your buddy were living in the house. This happened. Now you and your buddy are both working at this furniture store because Butch, he didn't work there full time. But like they would have him come in part time and, you know, help with like deliveries and, you know, moving things out on the floor, that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, that's an easy, easy connection for cops to make, right? Yeah, so they're like, here are two crimes, and you two keep popping up in both scenarios. They both could be categorized as insurance fraud. Butch confesses about his role in the spring break burglaries. He admits that he broke into the houses with a pass key, then sold the electronics in Ohio. From what I understand, I'm not exactly sure that he ratted on Ed. Like, I think he admitted to his part, but I'm not sure he gave up Ed's name. Oh, so he's just like, I was involved in the burglaries. Yeah. And Butch is released on a $3,000 bond. He wasn't involved in the arson, but he knew Ed's plan to help burn down the warehouse. So he's just feeling immense guilt. And the police are pressuring him. And now that he's admitted to this burglary, they're, you know, putting a lot of pressure on him. We know you were involved in this arson. And he's like, no, I, I did not set a fire. Yeah, I mean, he couldn't handle the pressure in the beginning when this whole burglary scheme came out. So it doesn't surprise me that a year later it's still bothering him and he's almost, you know, one little push, he's just going to give up the, give it up. Right after the arrest, he moves out of the apartment he shares with Ed and back to Pittsburgh with his mother, Rose. Butch feels very guilty and he knows that Ed was the leader in the serious criminal matter, but Butch accepts responsibility for what he's done. I mean, he's like, I know I played my part, but he's like, it wasn't my idea kind of thing. Yeah, I've screwed up. I'm going to go home trying to remove myself from this environment. And that, but and Ed's his best friend. So, I mean, you have those feelings too. And Butch felt it was a snowball effect. I mean, all of this stuff, it's just like starting small and it's gathering steam as it goes. He pledged allegiance to his fraternity brother, Ed, to protect him, to be there for him. But having his back has led to serious trouble. Yeah, sounds like it. Meanwhile, Lynn is warning Ed, you must do something about Butch. She's convinced that Butch will out them on the fire. Ed recognizes Butch's erratic behavior. I mean, his best friend, his brother is becoming a liability. Lynn and Ed purchase a handgun from a local gun dealer. They have a plan in motion. On Friday, June the 17th of 1988, Butch tells his mother he's going away for the weekend. Rose knows that her son has been kind of down in the dumps the past few weeks since the arrest, so she's happy that he's going to get out of the house. A little socializing with friends will be good for him. Well, yeah, I mean, you ha you hate to see your, uh, who knows how much he told his mother about all this, but I'm sure if he hasn't told her everything, she knows something's wrong with him, you know? Ed Weirer, Butch's high school friend who had recently graduated from Yale, 
picked him up and gave him a ride to the Greyhound bus station. Butch was excited to travel to Akron, Ohio to meet two girlfriends. Butch said his goodbyes to Edward, saying, see you Sunday, because his friend had planned to pick him up from the bus station when he returned back to Pittsburgh. 23-year-old University of Akron student Teresa Walkulchik and Carolyn Luley were friends of Ed Swigers, and that is how Butch had met them. Teresa had invited Butch to come up for the weekend and go to a party with them. Butch took the bus to Akron, where Caroline picked him up. Teresa would later tell investigators that Butch never showed up in Ohio. Oh, no. Eighteen months pass with no sign of Butch. He has been missing for a few days when his mother, Rose Pratt, finally filed a missing persons report. It seemed her son had just up and vanished. So he's dropped off at the bus station, gets on the bus to Akron, Ohio, never seen again. Never seen again. Okay. Can you imagine? No, I can't. So, I, mean, I just. I mean, as a parent, you'd have so many questions. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't even. Uh, I feel for anyone who's ever been in this situation for even a day, let alone for eighteen months. In October of 1989, Ed Swiger is arrested while a second-year law student at Temple University in Philadelphia. Michael Swiger, Ed's younger brother, is also arrested. When Michael is taken away in handcuffs, his fiance Susan was addressing their wedding invitations. And guess what they're charged with? What? Murder. Oh my God. On that day in June of 1988, the Swiger brothers had these two women lure Butch Pratt to Akron. He was driven by the women to a remote area near Hudson, Ohio. One of the women said she had to go, you know, she had to go. So they pulled over. She had to make it a pee-pee? Yeah. So while they're stopped, Butch gets out of the vehicle. I mean, probably like to stretch a little bit because he's been traveling all day by bus. Probably not the most comfortable way to travel, right? When all of a sudden the two women jump back in the vehicle and they drive away, they ditch Butch Pratt. They just leave him out on this road? Yeah. And when Caroline checks her rearview mirror, she sees Butch on his knees with Ed Swiger standing over him. Where do they come from? They were just, so this is a prearranged air, um, spot for Ed to get con, get Butch. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know, right? How, I mean, this is your fucking best friend, dude. Y'all shared all this time together in college and, you know, we're really close, lived, lived together. together and all this stuff. And I just don't, I don't know. I don't know how you arrive at this pl- place in your head where you could do this. A surprised Butch is now face-to-face with his best friend, Ed. And you got to remember, Ed is a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. He proceeds to attack Butch. Ed hits Butch, knocking him to the ground. As the fight progresses and the two are kind of rustling around, Ed delivers a series of blows to Butch's head and just continues to beat on him. Butch's head is slammed on an exposed well pipe. Oh, no. Michael Swiger will later testify that he saw bones sticking through Butch's skin. Once Butch is physically incapacitated, the Swigers handcuff him, then use a necktie to bind his feet together. At this point, he's still breathing when the brothers load him in the car's trunk. The brothers drive to Ohio to a, um, I think it's Kent, Ohio, and that's where Lynn Carlin is at this time. They pick her up and they drive back to Pennsylvania. So we're talking some hours that Butch is in the trunk. Badly hurt. Yeah. When they finally arrive in Pennsylvania, they pop the trunk and Butch is dead. His body is cold and rigor mortis has already started to set in. So he's been dead he's for been dead. a while. He done been dead. Ed quickly goes to work digging a shallow grave on some property. It's like a farm. It was described as like a farm property where Lynn Carlin had been living. Butch Pratt is buried by a stream on this property. Ed Swiger is a success at everything he does, and Butch Pratt was just another roadblock. If you think about it. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. With Butch out of the picture, Ed begins his first year of law school at Temple University. Soon after he arrives at Temple, Ed dumps Lynn. Oh, no. And she's devastated. Ed begins a relationship with Teresa Walkulchik. I think I'm saying her name correctly. Is that that's one what, of the girls on the road, right? Yeah, one of the girls who helped him in this murder plan. 
man, you got these dumbass plans you're doing. They're they're dangerous. It keeps involving girlfriends. And, and you, uh, everybody knows about it. I mean, multiple people around you know about these plans: arson, burglary, now murder. Well, he keeps including girlfriends and then dumping them, and then they have this dirt. I mean, I, I don't get it. I, I, I mean, at what point are you going to be like, I shouldn't tell this girl. Either I'm going to stay with this girl. You should just not tell her. Or she, she shouldn't be included in your plans, period. Yeah. And that way, no matter what happens in your relationship, she won't be able to be like, hey, I got blackmail on you or I'm going to do this. Ed had told Lynn that Teresa was his cousin. So she was furious when she finds out she's been dumped for this other chick that she thought was... A cousin? So she's been around, and he's like, oh, no, don't worry. That's just my cousin. Yep. Oh, wow. That's just my baby daddy. So that's going to make her even more angry. Oh, yeah. So she's pissed because she's like, this little shit lied to me, and now he's going to dump me? Like, who the fuck does he think he is? I can just hear her. Lynn made threats to go to police, but she didn't because she was afraid of Ed. Well, that, and she's also tied up in a scheme with him. Arson's a big deal. You can catch a lot of years for arson. Yeah, you can. When questioned about Butch Pratt, Ed says he knows nothing about his friend's whereabouts. He probably disappeared to avoid the criminal burglary charges. Uh, yeah, right. Like, he's he's convinced that, you know, Ed, I'm sorry, that Butch skipped town. That's Which, his story is. Yeah. He must have be on, he must have took off for these minor burglary charges. Yep. In the meantime, Michael Swiger is not doing so well. He returns to school in Ohio. He bought a house. He got engaged, but he just wasn't doing well mentally. His grades were slipping, and he just can't shake what he's done. Well, he watched his brother beat a man to death. And he helped light a fire. And he helped... We're going to get into that. Sell stolen merchandise. I mean, there's a laundry list of things oh, he yeah. helped with. He's helped with everything. By fall of 1989, Lynn has moved to Sharon, Pennsylvania, and she's managing Diamond Design, which is an interior decorating firm. She has a new boyfriend. Lynn returns from an Arizona trip to find her house has been burned. Oh, no, dude. Scared, Lynn has a gut feeling about who might be responsible. Aside from the Swigers and the two women in Ohio, Lynn is the only person left who has ties to Butch Pratt's murder. She views the house fire as a message. You're next. If she was afraid of Ed before, now she understands that he is capable of hurting anyone who gets in his way. Yeah, so he's like reached, they've kind of went their separate directions and got new girlfriends and boyfriends, but he's still like, I'm going to get you or don't forget, I can do this. Yes. What the hell, Ed? A frightened Lynn shows up at the police station with an interesting story. A story that involves kidnapping, murder, guns, and a fire. Implicating herself in the arson, she explains to police that Ed Swiger mastermind the killing of Butch Pratt because he feared his friend would finger him for the two burglaries and the arson. So she's at the point where no matter if I get in trouble, if I don't do something, get him off the street or tell the cops where they can get him, He's going to get me one way or the other. Yeah, he's going to kill me. Lynn assists police in locating the body of Butch Pratt. The grave is shallow. It's only about 22 inches deep. And she explains that while Ed was digging, he kept hitting the clay in the ground and he couldn't go any deeper. Dental records are used to identify the very decomposed body. An autopsy will reveal that every bone in Butch Pratt's face was broken. That's horrible. Ed Swiger goes to trial for the murder of Roger Butch Pratt on January 29th of 1990. His bond was set at $1 million. Michael Swiger testified that his whole life he wanted to be liked by his big brother. Ed was so successful and seemed to be on top of the world. It wasn't until both brothers were in college that Ed tried forging a relationship with his kid brother. In spring of 1987, when Ed asked Michael to pick up the stolen electronics and sell them at Case Western Reserve University, Michael was so eager to please his brother. I mean, he just wanted to do anything to make his brother like him. Ed was so convincing. A year later, in May of 1988, when Ed asked Michael for another favor, he agreed. Of course, Ed Swiger told his brother, I need you to come up here to Pennsylvania and help install a security system at this furniture store where I work. But when Michael shows up in Pennsylvania, his brother springs on him like this change of plans. Ed doesn't want a security system. He wants Michael to help him set fire 
at the store's warehouse. Oh, yeah. By the way, we're just going to do a little arson. The plan was clear. Ed had worked out all the details, assuring his brother it was an easy payout and they would never get caught. Michael, hoping to gain his brother's love, sprinkled the lighter fluid throughout the warehouse. Michael Swiger's friend, Richard Nye, also helped, and Lynn offered them money in exchange for their help with the fire situation. Man, they used an accelerant? That's a no-no in arson. Don't ever use an accelerant. Yeah, well, I'm not sure we're dealing with the... Well, you can't because it always leaves some kind of a trace. Being Most a smell. amazing criminal minds here, Dylan. Some part of it doesn't burn down. They can smell the accelerant. They can see the pass on the walls of it leaking down and how it burns hotter quicker. So just, a, you know, hey, why am I giving people tips on arsons? Yeah, I don't know. No, don't do arson, okay? Sorry. During trial, Ed Swiger admitted to having a fight with Butch and even causing the man death, but said it was accidental. Ed alleged that his friend Butch had charged at him. He admitted to handcuffing Butch after the fight was over and placing a plastic bag over his head before putting him in the trunk of the car. All right. He says the bag was due to massive bleeding from Butch's head and he didn't want it all over the trunk. Yeah. Well, see, that's just bullshit. Ed admitted that he and Michael drove to Kent, Ohio, where they picked up Linda. Then they returned to Pennsylvania. Upon realizing that Butch had died, Ed and Michael dug a grave on the farm property. During cross-examination, the prosecutor asked Ed, if Linda Carlin had not come forward, you'd be getting out of law school and making plans to get married, right? And he says yes. So he admits, I wouldn't have told. That I'm just going on with my life. So they're trying to make it out like they did. The, there was no intention of killing him. Yeah. Ed admitted that Rose Pratt would still be chasing down leads trying to find her son, Butch. That's disgusting. Michael didn't plan the attack to kill Butch, nor did he physically assault the man. He claims that he thought Butch was already dead when he helped load him in the trunk. Michael will say the murder definitely made him feel very bad. His relationship with his brother deteriorated like once they were arrested. Um, even after the crime was committed, he says that immediately their relationship was forever changed. Well, yeah, I mean, it, they didn't, didn't sound like they had a real strong relationship anyway. Well, it sounds to me like Ed only wanted to reach out and be brotherly. When he used them. When he used them, exactly. On holidays and visits after the murder, the two didn't speak, and Michael said he was afraid of his brother. Like, if it's Thanksgiving and they're all hanging out, when Ed would show up, Michael would want to leave. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand that. Ed Swiger was given life in prison for aggravated murder and kidnapping. Michael Swiger was charged with manslaughter and kidnapping. He was given a 21 to 56 year sentence. He spent 16 years in prison. And I think he, um, yeah, he, de he deserved to be in prison. I hate what happened to him, but I think that's a fair penance for his part in this, don't you? Michael would later say in an interview that he first ignored his brother's letters from prison. He felt manipulated. And then he started going to church, and it changed him. Michael had spent a while blaming Ed for what had happened, but he came to understand the ideas of choice and free will, and he knew he had just made a bad choice, for which he was paying the price. When Michael finally accepted responsibility for his actions, he was able to mend his relationship with his brother Ed. Yeah, I mean, people do whatever they have to for their own mental health, I guess. Lynn Carlin, along with Teresa and Caroline, were charged with conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Lynn was given time in prison, but she was paroled October of 2012. I believe she was also charged with the arson. The other women were given a plea deal, and they served no time for their test in exchange for their testimony. <sighs> their role was minor. If that really get Ed, obviously, is the the rhinoceros in the room who deserves to go to jail and never get out. So that makes sense. While in prison, Michael Swiger earned two associate degrees, um, a bachelor's in business from Ohio University, and he studied theology at the Reform Theological Seminary. He wrote a book called A Trial for Innocence, which was nominated for Pulitzer Prize. Wow. While he was behind bars. He's authored five books while he was in prison, most of them focus on crime. In an interview with Cleveland.com, he said his books all have Christian themes. The moral of my story is that God can change anyone. He grabbed me from the depths. 
Well, I'm glad that, you know, it's funny that people can go to prison and get all these different, which is good. I think that's a very important part of rehabilitation, giving them tools to be productive citizens when they get out. But shouldn't we all have that access? I mean, you know, because that's federally funded education is what it is. Just now saying. Michael Swiger is married to Susan, his fiance. She waited 16 years on him. The whole time he's in prison, she waits. And they're about to get married before the cops got him 16 years ago. And she waits the whole time? She does. Wow. Now, I did read a, a bit of an interview with her. And she did say they had broken up for a period, I think, from like 2004 to 2006. But still. Because she was like, I just don't know how much longer I can do this. But they got back together. And they now have two children. He is the executive director of True Freedom Ministries. And he volunteers in prison ministry. Wow. Well, I mean, he did something with his, he took this and turned it into a positive, his experience. And I think he was definitely manipulated by his brother. And uh, yeah, so that's good. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like he's made a lot of effort to turn his life around. Yeah, someone puts that much work and effort in. And like I said, I think the 16 years in prison was, a. Uh, am sure maybe Butch's mom or family doesn't agree probably maybe or maybe they do agree i don't i can't speak for them but i think that's an appropriate amount of penance for him and his role in this rose pratt and other members of the pratt family don't want any contact with michael swiger though he has expressed remorse for his role for the pratts there can be no closure for what the swigers have done well yeah i mean i'm glad he's doing that and being positive and all that but, I mean, that doesn't mean other people have to be like, oh, yeah, cool, let's all forgive, you know. In the early 2000s, Michael Swiger sent Rose Pratt a book about grief. Uh, and she was just like, who are you to fucking tell me about grief, basically? I think that's inappropriate. Yeah. I mean, I'm like again, I'm glad he's doing all this and feeling better about his life. But fuck you, dude. That's not cool. Well, and Michael recognizes that. He told a reporter, quote, I can understand him, meaning Butch's brother, not wanting to forgive me. Unforgiveness hurts the party who holds on to it, but I'm not the right messenger for that. I'm not the one to reach out to the Pratt family. That's his perception of religious text or whatever. I don't agree with that. I would never forgive you. I would hope that you die every single day. And I would celebrate your death when you did finally die, if it happened. But I like the fact that he recognizes, like, I'm not the person to reach out to the Pratt family. Like, their their feelings are their feelings to own. But you sent her the book, bro. And it's not, yeah, but you got to, I mean, that was like in the early 2000s. He was still a young man. I know, he's trying to do all the right thing. And he and probably he, thought he was doing something positive or like trying, you know. I'm sure. He was making an effort. I'm sure, but still. It's not a good look. Well, I know. I agree with I you. I don't forgive this guy, and it's not even my family. I play the devil's advocate, Dylan. <laughs> I'm not forgiving you, Michael. You know me? I'm always advocating for the devil. Ed Swiger is up for parole in August of 2029. He is currently at Grafton Correctional Institute, which is in Grafton, Ohio. The Pratt family says they will continue to petition the Ohio corrections officials to deny his release. They have rallied friends, loved ones, the community to write letters, petition, sign petitions, you trying to ensure that Ed Swiger does not get out of prison. I don't think he should. He's like a fucking psychopath, and right? He's a or, big, he's a, I mean, he has no qualms with, like, taking out anybody that gets in his way. He masterminds those burglaries. He burns down a store. He th kills his best friend. Which is probably one of the worst things you could do, right? Threaten the ex-girlfriend. Threatens the ex-girlfriend. Burns other stuff I down. I mean, had he not gone to prison for Butch's murder, I feel like he would have probably murdered again. Here's the thing. When you set a, a, a structure on fire, you, and you might think you know it's empty, you don't know who's there. And again, you're putting all the emergency service people life at risk to put the fire out. So I think arson is a very, very deviant and dangerous thing for something someone to do i mean it's very scary it is it's like a blatant disregard for anyone else their, yes their life their property. property yeah i mean so yeah I, I, he i think he he showed everyone what he's really about and i think he would definitely um it's just his personality it's not like he was in this weird circumstance or 
you know, someone else. He was the mastermind of all this stuff. And he is not afraid to, or he wasn't afraid to um, scare people. And he's a big meathead. And you know he's been there pumping fucking iron this whole time. And so he's even bigger meathead than when he went to jail. And he's a dangerous person. And he would hurt, I think he would likely harm someone else in some way if he got out of jail. I could be wrong. He could be completely reformed. Well, had he not been caught, he would have continued. He would have been a lawyer, perhaps, but would have continued, I think, to do these criminal activities. Well, when it benefited him, he had lawyer or not, he had he he proved that he's not uh, afraid to bend the rules. Well, he kills his best friend to cover up a crime that he committed that was of his own doing. But when faced with the thought of punishment or having to accept responsibility for his own actions, he's willing to take a life. Right. And threaten multiple other people. Yeah. He's an asshole. No, he's an asshole. You know, he could have just left it alone. And then if the other stuff came out, then so be it. You have to deal with it. I set my responsibility for the burglary and the arson. And I would have got in trouble. I would have got some time in jail. And he could have just, oh, well, I learned my lesson. But no, he's willing to kill his best friend, beat him to death. How brutal is that? And then have no regard for him, not even be like after the fight happened or him beating him, like, oh my God, what have I done? No, he's going to handcuff him and hog time and throw him in a fucking trunk for hours. I mean, there's just no regard at all for his best friend in any way. No, and I think he totally had plans to kill him, put a plastic bag over his head. Uh, You've got to know that's going to kill someone. Uh, that's... I needed the plastic bag over his head because he's bleeding a lot and I didn't want it on my trunk. That's a dumbass answer. And then what are you going to do? You're going to take him to Pennsylvania. He's been beaten severely on the verge of death. What are you just, then you're going to let him go? I then mean, you're going to take him your, to the hospital. What was your plan after that? Yeah. So I think, I think you're right. His intent was to murder him, kill him and get rid or just get rid of him. Any obstacle in his way, he gets rid of it. Yep. Man, Ed's a dick. Yeah, Ed's a piece of shit. God. And I feel so horrible for Butch and his family and uh, his mother, Mrs. Pratt. I I do too. I've read several interviews with Mrs. Pratt, and it's so pitiful. She talks about her son, and there was a line at the end of one of the articles where she said, it was a pleasure raising him. That's so sad. And here she has this young adult. She's raised all these years. He has a good kid. A good kid. And has all this opportunity and life in front of him, getting to see him transition into adulthood. He was the first of his family to attend college and graduate from college. Well, even more so then. So she was very proud of him. I mean, he worked super hard. She was a single mom raising three kids in this very working class neighborhood. It, I believe she lived in like an apartment building. It didn't seem like they had a lot of money. Yeah, just good, salt-of-the-earth working people. Yeah, so here he works his ass off to get into this private college. I'm sure that probably costs quite a bit of money. She's working all you know, working all this time to help pay for this, sending her son to school. He's doing great. He's got plans for the future. He's going to go get his master's degree. He's the first of their family to graduate from a four-year college. I mean, she's got to be super proud of him. And then something like this happens? It's really sad. <sighs> Shit. Now I'm sad. Well. But I'm not I'm not more sad than her, so I'll, I'll make it. Yeah, it's a sad situation, but I just thought this was a very unusual case. It's just betrayal. Something and we hadn't covered before. Just a monster. It's like a monster. He, Ed's a monster, but it was like a in, a in a shiny package that people didn't realize until too late that he's willing to go to these lengths. He's like American Psycho. Yeah, no shit. He's like the Patrick Bateman. Oh, he's got the... He got the Really fucking well printed business cards. Probably. Oh, An alabaster with the raised lettering. Okay, so thank you for that, Heather. Um, I'm going to have to recover. I'm going to have another glass of coffee. Why do you always say glass of Why coffee? Why does it, you care? I'm not calling it a cup of coffee. I'm going to call it a glass of coffee. Oh, gosh, his glass of so coffee. So if you, you want to reach out to us in any form or fashion about anything, you can contact us at mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to personally thank our new patrons and our old patrons and all our other listeners because I'm going to tell you what, our downloads is popping like a motherfucker. Dylan's so excited. 
He yeah, checks this... he checks his analytics on the podcast about every five minutes. Well, look. Look, we got more downloads. There's more downloads. There's well, more... I... He, he's obsessed. So the more downloads that we get, Dylan runs around skipping and like clicking his heels. I got to say, when we first started this, it was just a like, hey, let's try this. And the, when the first 10 people listened to us, I still remember that. And we were excited about that. Non-family members or friends are actually listening in the first hundred and thousand. And now the first hundred thousand and the first two hundred thousand. And now we're, you know, heading towards five hundred thousand. Who knows where it's going to stop? We really appreciate it. And it really tickles us to death. And um, we're just glad you guys want to listen to us. All right. Yeah. And <laughs> wait, there's, but there's more. Okay. No, that was it. Okay. <laughs> I think we have one more episode left in the month of February. Of course, February is a very short month, but it doesn't it seem like it's just flown by? Yeah, it has. I don't know where February went. No, I feel like yesterday was January, and then it was Valentine's Day, and now we're almost into March. Jeez Louise. But I have some great cases coming up for March. Ooh, you're going to do a good one on my birth- our birthdays? Well, my birthday's in April. I know. Mine's in March. Yeah, I know. You Aries. Ow. It's going to be Aries season. Dylan's going to be all sassy to watch him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have some great cases coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So you're definitely going to want to stick around. Check those out. Um, I could drop a few hints, but I'm not sure if I should. I'll give them just one. Well. Give them one hint. We've got a serial killer coming up. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, um. Really? Another serial killer. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got another really famous case out of North Carolina. Uh-oh. It's kind of a, a known case, but to be honest, I've heard the name quite a bit, but I don't know a ton about it, so I'm excited to bring that story to everybody. Ooh. So good stuff coming up. Of course, we're going to continue our offbeat celebrity conspiracy theories series <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. Going to have another... Great celebrity conspiracy theory dropping on Wednesday. And can I just tell a quick story here, Dylan? We had someone reach out on Twitter and tell us that she was Courtney Love's travel, um, a, a, I guess like travel agent from like 2004 to 2005. That like, was wild. Like handling all the travel for her tours and that she was a fucking nightmare. And she was like, I loved your podcast about Kurt was murdered. Everything you said was spot on and she's like Courtney Love is just like a horrible fucking person and she was terrible to work for it was a nightmare and so she knows because she really had direct contact with Courtney yeah isn't that crazy that is crazy I want to thank her for reaching out and that just gives you some validation for what we said about Courtney yeah she's some shit well she's a different person that's for sure Oh, we are still accepting some listener submissions. We're going to have another listener stories episode coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to reach out, again, Dylan gave you the email address. It's a mountain murders podcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just search for mountain murders. Hope you guys have a great week.